Hey there everyone, my name is AJ Pickett and I make videos about Dungeons & Dragons lore with a massive archive of videos for you to enjoy, plus two new videos every week and a weekend live stream. This channel has one of the very best communities of viewers, so subscribe and join us in the comments section below or in the channel's Discord server. Hey, do you want to play a noble dragonborn except you have fur and your breath weapon is a blast of intimidating sound? Then this video is for you. I was originally asked about the playable race called the Leonin before the sourcebook Mystic Odysseys of Theros was released, so sorry for the delay, let's get into it. What is this Theros place? The bare basics is that it is a world and perhaps a plane of existence, a parallel dimension within what we call the Magic the Gathering multiverse, rather than a world within a crystal sphere within the phlogiston sea of the vast Dungeons and Dragons prime material plane. In short, it has a totally separate body of fictional lore behind it developed for the Magic the Gathering card game. Currently we are dealing with the card game lore being a different multiverse that we can draw on as we see fit, but there is no official link between the two. Parent company Wizards of the Coast has decided that they can coexist perfectly fine with minimal problems and so far this has been completely accurate. In this video I'll be providing a little info on Theros and the history of the Leonin there, but I'm also going to be talking about the numerous varieties of Leonin you can find in the Magic the Gathering lore from different planes, and there are also many similar but quite different lion humanoids you can also find in the Dungeons and Dragons multiverse lore, including my theory on the nature of the Outer Plains Gardinals. But first, we shall start with Theros. Let's take a ride to another multiverse within the Dungeons and Dragons Omniverse. A long time ago, a bunch of celestial archons decided to just take over a plane of existence in the Magic the Gathering multiverse and rule it with a squeaky clean but iron fist and the local mortals were mostly not very happy about it because the archons went way overboard on the lawful side of lawful good. Helping these archons to enforce their will on the people were a lion humanoid race called the Leonin who were very honourable, fierce and thought that since the archons were the part of the forces of law and order in the multiverse they were clearly on the right side and all the complaints from all the other mortal races were just a bunch of whining because they were naughty little rascals who kept expecting to be let off the hook for all their naughtiness. Well, the Leonin were turning a blind eye to a lot of pain and suffering that the other mortal races were going through for real and it got so bad that the mortals did the only thing left to them and they prayed. They prayed hard, the kind of desperate prayers that resonate in the great beyond and hey presto, they actually managed to manifest some real gods. I think it's a very good example of how the planes of celestial forces representing lawful goodness in the D&D multiverse sound great as distant armies protecting the prime material plane but you really don't want them up close and personal in your day-to-day -day existence because they're just too lawful and too good for beings of the prime material plane to deal with tolerance is not a word found in their dictionary they don't like a world with shades of moral and ethical gray it's either measure up get better or get cut down the leonin failed to understand that until they were too far in to turn around Archons in the Magic the Gathering multiverse are different from Archons in the D&D multiverse. They're more true to the traditional meaning of the name, which is ruler. So they're all about that uncompromising moral rigidity and ferocious retribution. The whole era of Archon rule on Theros was known as the Age of Trax, beginning with the Archons marching from the north and ending with the fall of their empires. Miletus, a city-state inspired by Athens, was the seat of Empire of the Immortal Archon named Agnomachos. He, along with the rest of the Archons, were at war with the race of giants, and he justified a lot of his abuse of mortals under his rule as necessary hardships to aid in this great war effort. The Archons captured and using magic twisted some of those giants into the form of the Hundred-Handed Ones, who were ordered to build endless monuments in the Archons' honour so the Archons certainly had, and have, astounding egos. Generations of Leonin served in this tyrannical regime, a nigh unstoppable army that carved out the Archons' empire in blood, until finally, two humans, Kainaos and Tiro, joined by their love for one another and for freedom, rose to challenge him. The people rallied to their cause, and Nagnomachos was defeated. Kanaeus and Tiro were based on the Athenian lovers Harmodius and Aristogaton, known as the Tyrannocytes, who assassinated the Athenian tyrant Hipparchus in 514 BC. 
That was a particularly swanky move on Wizards of the Coast part, I thought. Nice way to respect the sources they're drawing on, as Theros is 100% inspired by the vibe of Greek mythology. So the gods that were basically willed into existence by the desperate mortals are much more present in their affairs, and the player characters in the Theros setting are also quite involved with gods that take a much more active hand in their world, for better or for worse. The legends of Theros say that the god Ephara granted humans magic to help them overthrow the Archon and cast out his Leonin guard. The humans then created four great polis, or city-states. Miletus is now one of those, along with Akros, Setessa, and Oreskos. It is Oreskos where the Leonin ended up, isolating themselves from the other races. Generations have passed since those ancient days, but still, their entire species carries the heavy burden of their disgrace. So it's understandable that they want nothing more to do with the rest of the world and the treachery of strangers. Now, while I will be concentrating on the Leonin of Theros, let's not forget that the Magic the Gathering multiverse contains many different planes of existence. It's quite unlike the Dungeons & Dragons multiverse in so many ways. But still, if you're going to include the Leonin in other campaign settings, and I have absolutely no problem with that, by the way, then why restrict their origin to just the plane of Theros? Why not the giant, flying, reptile-riding, sun-worshipping, partially metallic Leonin of the plane of Mirrodin? Or the Leonin from the plane called the Shard of Naya, who have much more diversity in their appearance and cultures and call their species the Nakato? There are a lot of possibilities if you decide to delve into some deeper Magic the Gathering lore. Oh wait, I'm the person who's <laughs> supposed to be delving into the deeper Magic the Gathering lore. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the Mirrodin and the Shard of Naya. Mirrodin is a plane where metal is very prevalent. It was originally known as the Artificial Plane of Argentum, and I'm told that in the novel by Will McDermott called The Moons of Mirrodin, it's an excellent read and contains solid Mirrodin lore. In a nutshell, this concerns a planeswalker artifact being named Khan, basically a big silver golem who originated on the world of Dominaria. Khan created this perfect plane of Argentum and made use of these powerful artifacts named Mirari to create another artificial being called Memnarch to look after the place while Khan was off gallivanting around the multiverse. Memnarch went very weird, became corrupted by a mysterious black oil substance and renamed the plane to Mirrodin, then set about importing all sorts of living beings from other planes to populate the artificial world. Mirrodin, it turns out, is a hollow world with massive pits, red and blue, that lead down from the surface to the planet's core. On the surface, the new life forms combined metal and flesh, and this included a species of Leonin who inhabited a city called Tajnar, a towering city of gold, also known as the Ancient Den, the seat of the royal line of the Leonin Ka, or kings. Tajnar was destroyed and rebuilt again, but with more powerful magical defences. Uh, clearly, since Leonin did not originate on Mirrodin, they were imported there by Menarch and were adapted to survive the new plane so they could, well, they tend to all look a bit similar to each other, classic Golden Lion style. I think the place that Memnarch took these Leonin from was Alara. The fate of Alara tells us a hell of a lot about the real power of the planeswalkers and the nature of mana, the uh, mystical force that they use itself. Alara was once a vast plane whose realms, including an ancient kingdom known as Vithia, flourished in an era of peace and wisdom. But many centuries ago, an unknown planeswalker plundered Alara for its mana. The drain on the plane's mana shattered something deep in its metaphysical structure, causing it to undergo radical planar refraction. The plane broke into shards along mana lines, diffusing into its component parts like light refracted in a prism and shattering Alara's civilizations and ecologies along with it. The shard named Naya is the birthplace of the planeswalker known as Ajani. It's mostly a green mana plane with red and white mana. It is additional influences on its nature and structure. So basically life, passion, community and the wild are dominant themes in its reality. At one time, the Leon and Nakatl were the most civilized race in Naya and the undisputed rulers of that plane. During its golden era, the Nakatl's mountainous empire of the clouds had an extensive system of roads, bridges, and aqueducts uh, arcing between the peaks. But internal strife destroyed the empire. A revolutionary group known as the Claws of Marizi waged a guerrilla war, shattering the rule of law, literally inscribed in a scratch language on a massive granite disc slab called the Coil, and bringing the Nakatl civilization to its knees. 
well, it was well on its way to collapse anyway thanks to the laws becoming so convoluted that only an elite group named the Pride of Judges understood them and brutally enforced them. So there was an open warfare in the streets and the claws of Marizzi and the Pride of Judges fought for dominance. In the end, Marizzi's revolutionaries triumphed and the coil was broken. During the destruction of the city, the wall that contained the coil was defaced and in some parts destroyed. For the members of the Claws, it was symbolic breaking of the structures of society that kept them down and subjugated their true nature. So if you're thinking about using a background for a Leonin character from Naya, you have two main options, the lowland, jungle dwelling and primal Claws of Marizzi, or the cloud Nakatl, still clinging to the last remnants of their fallen empire in the mountains. The physical diversity of the Nakatl is both a reflection of the plane's mana energy influences, but also tells us this place is where the Leonin have existed and evolved for a very long time. They may have originated there, we don't know for sure. So you can pick from all the different types of big cats for the physical features of a Nakatl character, and they can be as refined or as barbaric as you like in their culture. After Alara was made whole once more, the Nakatl migrated to the civilized lands of Bant and began integrating into the city-dwelling culture. The Bant cat people, were, who adapted to the chivalrous code of knights and soldiers, simply call themselves Leonin. The Nayan pride of the Sunstrikers is loyal to the planeswalker Ajani. I'm not sure if the savage Nakatl are still around. They are fully wild and disdain the use of weapons and armor. They have distinctive appearance with no manes, grey fur and black tiger-like stripes. There are other species or subspecies that may or may not be related and their current fate is unknown. Some presumed extinct, such as the Neshoba, ogre-sized cat people that look like a cross between snow leopards and saber-toothed tigers. Native to the cold regions of Dominaria, they may have some drastic, horrific examples of them left around for after the Phyrexian invasion of Dominaria. We don't know for sure. Interestingly, Rakshasa exist in the Magic the Gathering multiverse in much the same way Rakshasa exists in the Dungeons and Dragons multiverse. There are some wild theories that both multiverses may share a common link to the Abyss, but I think that's somewhat unlikely. Possible, but unlikely. In the D&D multiverse, while there exists the Gardinals from the plane of Elysium, the question is, are these the original source of the primaterial plane lion-like humanoids, or do the Gardinals have no connection to them at all? There's also more bird humanoid gardinals as well, and other animal types, so it's iffy at best, but an interesting idea. Chances are it's pure coincidence, but the prime material plane influences the outer planes just as much as the outer planes influences the prime. I would expect that there are ref reflections, so to speak, manifestations of all the creatures one can find in the prime material plane, particularly those that are either sapient or of particular interest to sapient creatures. After all, the outer planes are realms of thought and belief. Mount Celestia has celestial versions of most mortal sorts of animals. In Elysium, the humanoid animal featured gardeners have never been in the habit of recording their history, so they don't actually know how long they've been in existence or what their true origin was. They are led by the most powerful Leonel, known as Talisid, and five chosen companions, and they are the epitome of the nomadic, super good paladin who only ever takes what is necessary from the absolutely jaw droppingly, stunningly beautiful and harmonious landscape. There are many wonders and mysteries within Elysium, and I'll be bringing you a lot of lore on it very soon. But as for the Leonel Gardinals, they are on the top of the much less formal hierarchy, and are really quite similar to the more rigidly lawful good Archons of Celestia. Leonels do occasionally visit mortal worlds of the Prime Material Plane. In fact, one was wandering the Great Shah grasslands of southern Faerun in the year 1373, Dale Reckoning. The Gardinal Leonals are very easy to tell apart from the Leonin in that they are typically six feet tall and they have an omnivorous diet. They do eat a lot of protein because they are very fit, fast and muscular, pretty close to physically perfect. And of course, they can cast spells and lay healing hands on creatures. Okay, back to Theros. Theron Leonin typically do not worship any of their main gods, but some do still practice the faith of Heliod and Nylea. Heliod is the god of the sun, and Leonin priests will lead ceremonies of worship on the first clear-skied morning of each month. Temples to Heliod often feature stairs up to a rooftop courtyard enabling sun worship, but the Leonin typically do not build temples, so an open courtyard or village centre serves the same purpose. Across Theros, the largest holiday aligned with Heliod is the summer solstice, celebrated with three days of ceremonious feasting, weddings, and oaths of loyalty. The worship of Nylea can be identified by a tree often surrounded by dancing butterflies. 
The influence of Nilea can be seen in Leonan culture and the general disdain for agriculture and crop farming and the great respect for animals that they hunt. So you don't see Leonan cubs who are raised by a community faithful to Nilea being cruel to small animals that they catch. And they don't play with the wounded animals in typical cat-like fashion. Leonan prides are close-knit communities and a lot of social statuses based on these family relationships. So they have a larger lexicon of words to describe exactly how another Leonan is related to them. They're not just, there's not just one word for aunt or uncle, and there are many different kinds of cousin. While each Leonan is raised to be proud and self-reliant, they always tend to prefer working and living as part of their family group. And this culture works just as well with Leonin who adventure away from their homeland and find a new ragtag pride of their own in an adventuring group. Most Leonin adventurers, if asked what their goals are beyond adventuring life, will be just a return to their own people and the comfort and complexity of their own pride. Retiring to a simple life, passing on their skills to young Leonin. Leonin have a matriarchal society and each pride is led by the elder female called a speaker. Each year, on the day of the first moon after the autumn equinox, matriarchs from all the Leonin prides gather at Tethmos to select a monarch who acts as a representative of the prides to the wider world. Most female Leonin will stay with the pride they were born into, while the males will wander and marry into other prides. On Theros, most Leonin live amongst the plains of Roreskos, an area of great golden fields and savannas nestled between the foothills of the Catathon and Oronaeod mountains. Many prides live in either very well-made tent villages or dens dug into the foothills. Dens are usually comprised of small interconnected networks of underground chambers. Large shared spaces in these dens are typically decorated with rich woven textiles, bone crafts and rich clay and crystal pottery. The dens are cool in the summer but Leonin are a sun-loving people and prefer to be outside, even sleeping outdoors whenever the weather permits. Laws, customs, culture and pride politics vary from pride to pride of course. Leonin make a conscious effort to separate themselves from humanity and the other races, so they tend to be closed-minded and xenophobic, particularly to those races. So if something new seems too much like some foreign cultural influence, the elders of the pride will tend to stamp it out in favour of more traditional Leonin culture. This also includes foreign words, so Leonin have a habit of making new Leonin words rather than adding words from other languages to their own. It's a subtle thing, but it says a lot about the way that they think. They're raised in closed groups of cubs around the same age and tend to hunt, play, fight and train together until they reach adulthood. There is not a lot of difference between the genders until puberty and you will have to patiently explain what the term tonboy means to a Leonin. They are omnivorous but tend to mostly eat meat. They add wild herbs and spices to meals gathered locally but only to preserve or add nutrition. They don't really like eating vegetables. They do harvest grains and a typical Leonin meal will be something like a spit roasted bird stuffed with herbs and bread mashed together with animal fat. Birds form the bulk of their prey and they grow up catching them wild every day with lots of skills for hunting different types of birds. Leonin will, who have never met a Kenku or an Arakokra, will probably take a moment to adjust and I assure you they will be thinking about what they taste like and picture them trussed up and basting over a nice glowing bed of embers, particularly when said bird folk are pissing them off. Leonin are predators. They are confident, proud, and when roused to action, which is pretty easy, they're very focused. If a Leonin has a problem with you, they don't make it a secret, and confrontation is quite likely unless someone else steps in to handle it. Leonin raised outside of their own culture tend to suffer from a lack of the daily hunting and the close teamwork and socialization of their pride mates, and they may end up being aloof, withdrawn, and lack respect for their prey overly cruel at times and with a tendency to intimidate smaller and weaker people for their own amusement. They can be bullies. This certainly plays into other cultures' biases towards them and enhances that stereotype of the hulking Leonin thug. They can always find workers' guards, bouncers, debt collectors and bounty hunters. That being said, Leonin can and often do anything that humans can do, aside from dry off as quickly after bathing. <laughs> Leonin hate bathing in water and are not enthusiastic swimmers but most do know how to swim just as well as anyone else even though they do live in pretty vast plains and uh, open grasslands. Leonin have a racial bonus of plus two to constitution and a plus one to strength. They're not quite as tough as dwarves when it comes to poisons but they can display acts of endurance that put half-orcs to shame and earn the grudging respects of the dwarven people. 
They enjoy physical challenges. Other peoples often perceive Leonin as quick to take offence, intolerant of criticism or belligerent. The truth is that many Leonin simply enjoy fighting, whether verbal or physical. They take pleasure in argument, wrestling, sparring and even battle, enjoying the opportunity to exercise their minds and their bodies. One of the best ways to gain the trust and friendship of Leonin is to hunt and fight alongside them. Being invited to go hunting together is a gesture of respect and acceptance from a Leonin and should not be refused out of hand as they, they, they'll find this quite personally insulting. Hunting is integral to all Leonin and they have a trait called hunter's instincts that gives them a racial proficiency in either athletics, intimidation, perception or the survival skill. They also have 60 foot dark vision and impressive retractable claws that can inflict 1d4 slashing damage along with their strength bonus. Leonin bring their claws out often, much like a hand gesture or as a reflection of their mood, but also purely to intimidate, and believe me, it's highly effective. They also tend to sharpen their claws just like cats do, loving a good scratch at a post or some rough catchy surface. They enjoyed a good stretch and scratch after a nap, tend to like a good nap after a meal and tend to only eat one large meal per day. Leonin who snack or eat multiple meals per day tend to pack on the pounds and become uh, overweight, a good indication that they were raised outside of their own culture. All Leonin, male or female, can roar. In most species, the vocal cords are shaped like triangles where they protrude into the creature's airway, but in Leonin, the protrusions are flat and shaped like a square, courtesy of the fat deep within the vocal cord ligament. This shape allows the tissue to respond more easily to passing air, letting the Leonin roar louder with less lung pressure and Leonin can roar about 25 times louder than a gas powered lawnmower. In game terms, as a bonus action, the Leonin can let out an especially menacing roar. Creatures of their choice within 10 feet of them that can hear them must succeed on a wisdom saving throw or become frightened of them until the end of the Leonin's next turn. The difficulty class of the saving throw equals 8 plus the Leonin's proficiency bonus plus their constitution modifier. Their ability to roar is limited to once between each short or long rest. Along with their personal names, Leonin identify themselves by their pride. This might be Grexus of the Flintclaw Pride, or Doxia of the Company of the Yellow Satchel, in the case of Leonin who identify their adventuring group as their adopted pride. Urban Leonin may just identify with where they live, such as Pai Zathior of Waterdeep or whatever. Leonin can be found all over Theros, and the source book provides descriptions of a few notable prides. One collection of Leonin prides, the Iron Manes, doesn't recognise the authority of the matriarchal speaker. These fearsome warriors live in the foothills of the western Katishon Mountains, acknowledging no authority but their own. The warriors of the tribe stain their fur with rust to declare their status and ornament themselves with claws and small bones taken from defeated opponents. While intensely territorial, the Iron Manes sometimes offer their services as guards or guides, though they generally disdain working for anyone but other Leonin, and beyond that, would rather work with centaurs, minotaurs or satyrs, or fey folk than with humans and their ilk. Numerous Leonin fighters and rangers count themselves as Iron Manes, and currently they are gaining more of a societal presence among all Leonin, thanks to the current speaker for all prides being somewhat unusually a male. Then you have the Sun Guides prides. They are well adapted after living in the vast grasslands for countless generations. They know the way of Rescos beasts and seasons better than any. Both mystical and knowledgeable, the Sun Guides read the messages in plant growth and animal migrations and they make their place in the natural cycle. Sun Guide prides might be found throughout Oreskos, but most orbit the lake known as Sun's Mirror. And while these prides sometimes seek their dens during the harshest winters, many will spend years out on the open plains uh, just migrating around. Many druids, monks, rangers and sorcerers hail from the Sun Guide prides. Finally, the Swift Claws prides are among the greatest hunters of Rascos. The Swift Claws are known for speed and efficiency. Their hunts are known to be among the shortest and most fruitful. And while their martial prowess earns them respect, it also affords many Leonin more time to share tales and study the lore of their people. As a result, some of the greatest Leonin storytellers and historians number among the Swift Claws. Fighters and rogues are also uh, common among the Swift Claws, and many bards and wizards come from these prides as well. Yes, wizards have arcane traditions. And also don't forget that the Leonin have a movement speed of 35 feet as a normal, so they're actually truly a swift people. Of course, you can find species like the Leonin all over the D&D Omniverse. This race serves as a great template 
for many different kinds of cat folk who are more like big cats rather than the tabaxi who are more like smaller cats. If you like the lore in these videos, don't forget to check out videos by fellow Forgotten Realms lore masters. Check out my channels tab where I will have a list of them for you to explore. Please hit that like button if you made it this far. Subscribe if you like what I do. Check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos. Also, these videos are, uh, the scripts are written so that you have closed captions there. Um, please make use of them. Buy some merchandise, wear your geek with pride. And as always, thanks for listening and I'll be back with more for you very soon. Thank you.